Um, I'm Joan <coughs> Lippincott from CNI, and I'm really delighted to have my wonderful co-presenters, Kelly Miller from University of Miami and Tom Hickerson from University of Calgary. And we're going to be talking about purposeful space design for libraries. And the intent of this session is really to um, expose you, introduce you to some current thinking, some thinking that we've picked up on in various um, meetings and conferences we've participated in, in some cases helped organize, and some of the work that we've observed. Um, and not all of the ideas are things that you might want to implement in your own uh, libraries or facilities, but we want to really spark your thinking about what you're doing rather than just laying out the tables and chairs and looking for uh, where to put all the outlets in your buildings and to really think about what you're trying to do to support the mission uh, of your institution. So I'm going to give a very brief intro, hand it over to Kelly, then Tom, and then I'll come back and wrap up with uh, a little bit of discussion on assessment uh, of spaces. So my intro is to make sure that you're aware of all of the kinds of resources that you have access to. Uh, because you're here in this room, you're probably engaged or soon to be engaged in some type of space planning uh, exercise. So if you go to our website and browse by topic, you'll see a listing of publications, presentations, including sessions like these at our meetings. Some are recorded, some you'll find the PowerPoints for, but it's really a rich resource um, of uh, things that you can use as you design your own spaces. In your folders today, we are delighted to announce the next Designing Libraries for the 21st Century Conference. And Tom was the uh, original host and, and uh, the, the really founder of Designing Libraries. I've been involved since the inception. And we're going someplace new this fall. We're going to Georgia Tech. They've completed Tower One of their two tower gut renovation of their library building and will be able to see some other things in Atlanta as well. Registration for designing libraries almost always sells out relatively quickly. We'll put, the registration is not open. There's a website, but the registration is not open. We'll put out an announcement on CNI Announce when it is, and I urge you to register soon if you're interested in going. For many years, I've been working with an organization called the Learning Spaces Collaboratory. And Tom and Kelly's presentations are going to focus on some of our work with them. But I also <coughs> invite you to explore their website. They have very fine publications. While their work has focused much more on classrooms, science buildings and labs and other things, so much of it is relevant for libraries and particularly the focus of integrating space design and learning principles. I really value uh, what I've learned from working with them. And we did a small meeting with Learning Spaces Collaboratory in December, right after the CNI meeting. And Diane Goldenberg Hart from our uh, CNI uh, staff wrote a really nice report summarizing some of the findings uh, from that event. So Kelly's going to talk a little bit more about some of her work with the LSC. Usually I stand, but I'm going to sit for this. So um, thank you so much, uh, Joan. And it's an honor <laughs> to be here today uh, with you, and uh, especially with um, both Joan and Tom, who both have inspired me in different ways uh, professionally regarding uh, the development of learning spaces in libraries. So it's a real treat to be here. And uh, I am also grateful to Joan for inviting me to serve in this role of representing CNI um, at the Learning Spaces Collaboratory events. Um, so I feel a certain duty to report out to you about some of the things I learned. Uh, much was conceptual, so in the few, my few minutes that I have, I will try to ground some of the ideas uh, in examples from my work at the University of Miami Libraries. I think it will help uh, spark, hopefully, a, a robust conversation in Q&A. 
Um, from my point of view, uh, the Learning Space Collaboratory's focus, uh, how to design and plan effective learning spaces and its participatory methods are highly relevant to our work in libraries today. At research universities, we are increasingly approaching our physical and digital library environments from a mission-oriented point of view. Instead of thinking of our spaces as mere facilities that house physical collections and seats for studying, we are asking how can libraries support people who are learning, conducting research, and being creative? So this first event that, um, that I attended, um, actually I'm going to go back one. The first event that I attended, uh, Libraries as Spaces for 21st Century Learners and Learning, was held in December, as Joan mentioned, in DC. It was designed as a roundtable with participants, including more than a dozen library leaders and architects. We worked in small groups to identify space types in 21st century academic libraries and develop job descriptions for these spaces. So it was an interesting task, which I had never um, done in this way before. The five space types we named were, and hold on to your seats, staff spaces, <laughs> entry spaces, innovation zones, consultation spaces, and quiet spaces. The list obviously is not exhaustive, but rather representative of key space types that the group felt were particularly significant at this moment. When working on the job descriptions for the spaces, we focused on goals and skills and abilities needed, just as you would do if you were developing a job description for a person. What did we want these spaces to be able to do? The um, second event was called Why Spaces Matter, and it was held at the end of January at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. This meeting was designed with a research goal to gather a broad array of different stakeholders to work together to identify knowledge claims, what we believe to be true about how space matters to learners. According to the Learning Space Collaboratory's uh, principal, Jeannie Narum, this meeting would help lay the groundwork for a research-based theory of learning spaces to emerge. The group included representatives from organizations like the Council on Undergraduate Research, cognitive scientists, architects, space planners, instructional designers, technologists, deans, provosts, <coughs> and at least one librarian, me. Okay. So the presence of so many perspectives on campus space led us to an important overarching question uh, that I really I think is, is pressing for us. What if learning happens everywhere? What if the entire campus is a set of learning spaces, interconnected, indoor and outdoor, physical and digital? In both meetings, we came up with a lot of questions, many more than we did answers, actually. But we seem to come back again and again to naming some characteristics or aspects of 21st century learning spaces that I'd like to share with you today. In some cases, these characteristics may be aspirational, and we may not yet have the metrics of assessment for them. But in every case, I would argue that the spaces need to manifest these characteristics without using words. Um, space, indeed, is teaching without words uh, about what our institutional goals are. So um, the first one, uh, first characteristic uh, is interdisciplinary. So how might learning spaces contribute to encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration? And this is a picture of the room or learning space at Howard Hughes Medical Institute where we met in January. The person speaking here is Steve Fiore, a cognitive scientist and specialist in the emerging science of team science. He studies the question, how do people collaborate effectively on research when they come from different disciplines, different, back different backgrounds, different perspectives. Um, the man in the foreground is a recently retired professor, a chemist who has spent his career mentoring first generation college students to become scientists. It struck me as I was reflecting on the institute experience that this type of learning space was a flexible event space, a classroom for people with diverse sets of expertise that transformed in a way into an innovation zone because of the topic. In libraries, flexible event spaces of this sort hold the potential to gather learners and experts from across disciplines and to provide points of intersection with the public. A second, um, aspect that we 
kept coming back to about learning spaces was problem oriented. What is the role of the library in supporting and enabling problem oriented work? This is a learning space at the University of Miami that focuses on the problem or complex challenge of hurricanes. The sustained building simulates hurricanes up to category five. Research teams, including students, are working across disciplines from marine sciences to engineering to medicine to develop new approaches to increasing coastal resilience. Mm -hmm. Here you see living coral adhered to boards waiting to be placed in the large simulation tank above. Researchers are testing to see how the coral's growth is affected by hurricane forces. Another question we asked, how can spaces encourage serendipitous collisions? Another, so, um, and I pause there because I really struggle with this word collisions. I think we're bringing it from science. Uh, I would prefer encounters of a beneficial sort, uh, <laughs> but collisions is what we can t are talking about. Um, when I returned to Miami after uh, these events, I've begun to look for and begin to record as I can and with permission, permission such encounters. A few weeks ago, I was on the third floor of Richter Library, our main library, when our marine and atmospheric sciences librarian happened to walk out of the elevator at the same time that a kinetic sculptor from the art department was heading to meet her interdisciplinary research team in a space we call the faculty exploratory, which offers faculty space to meet together. The two had not yet met. The artist team is working on the coastal resilience project I mentioned above. In the conversation that happened outside the elevators, the artist showed the librarian a sketchbook where she's uh, making sketches from field trips that her research team is making to sites along the coast in Miami. At both of our LSC meetings, we seem to argue that these types of encounters are characteristics of 21st century libraries. Um, Another characteristic is facilitating conversation. So, uh, so conversational engagement as opposed to transactional encounters. Structured conversations with trained <coughs> peers and experts are taking place increasingly in spaces that we might call consultation zones or spaces. These zones also requiring new types of staffing offer walk-in and appointment-based models for academic help to support learning connected to curricula. In DC in December, we made the case that consultation spaces aim to normalize struggle as part of the learning, research, or creative process. By being in highly visible library spaces, consultation zones seem to destigmatize help by letting the student know that they are not alone in the learning process, that it is an interdependent process and a necessary part of learning. By decreasing isolation, could these spaces also be helping with retention? persistence and well-being. Um, another aspect that is familiar to all of us is flexibility. Um, but I would say in maybe more ways than even we've been thinking about. Um, so uh, at the University of Miami, we've converted a non-flexible space that held compact shelving of bound periodicals into a learning commons with a consultation zone that can shift from hosting tutoring sessions involving more than six different academic service partners from across campus into open study space, depending on the time of day. And the partners themselves are a combination of headquartered and satellite. Um, one of the final characteristics I'll mention is biophilic. So a big term that was coined by biologist E.O. Wilson that refers to our interdependence with the natural world, our urge to affiliate with nature. Another characteristic, again familiar to us, but have we really um, done enough inquiry about this, I don't know. Importantly, at these events, we didn't talk about users, we talked about learners. So we shifted the focus from being on people inv involved in transactions to people who are constantly changing in the midst of dynamic, complex processes that occur over time and space. At any given time, this learner could be a student, a faculty member, a staff member, a community member. And finally, I think I saved maybe the most important for the last slide, the importance of spaces and fostering connections between individuals were prominent in our mind. 
How do different groups of people with different backgrounds and experiences find connection with each other and maybe even with themselves and their own backgrounds and experiences? How do we make spaces that are fully inclusive? Um, and just one last note, and I'm excited to hear what Tom is going to share. Uh, but um, after I thought about Kathleen Fitzpatrick's talk, I was reminded of um, our own University of Miami strategic plan, which says we aim to become the heart of learning. Uh, as I consider questions we raised at uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute especially, I was curi I'm curious increasingly about how we're shifting in libraries from focusing in a Jeffersonian way on libraries as the mind or the brain of the university to uh, maybe more of a, a heart, uh, um, a, a quiet pulsing um, energy that helps, that could hold the potential to help um, heal some of the challenges that our universities are facing. So I'll pause there. So my talk and Kelly's uh, align like they should be one talk. Um, there's, there's so much uh, 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 commonality between the two presentations and, and the one gives examples of the larger one. I'm coming to it uh, from the architectural design uh, approach and permeability is a uh, word that's increasingly being introduced into architectural design thinking about innovation spaces and uh, it, it seems particularly appropriate to libraries. Um, we are really uh, one of the fastest changing places on our campus and um, so to be able to begin our investigation with the idea that we're not seeking permanence but that in fact we are trying to create permeable spaces is a really important element in architectural design. So, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, they're open and transparent spaces and uh, not just from the inside out but from the outside in. Uh, there are spaces in which anyone entering it can assume a, a sense of ownership of the space and the shaping of, of what they do in the space, but in fact what the space is like for everyone. There are creative spaces uh, in which architectural design does not determine behavior. And um, if you worked with architects, you can understand this is an important point. And, um, and the final one, I'll come back to that, is, is to enable cutting edge technologies, but to balance this with humanness. So uh, I'm going to give some examples from, um, principally from the University of, of, of Calgary, uh, largely from the Taylor Family Digital Library, um, but also from the city of Calgary and from the Watt Family uh, Innovation Center at Clemson University. And uh, Barbara Spiel, uh, who uh, has been a colleague for me in recent time with Jeannie Naram and, and Orge Vanegas from Texas A&M and, and writing a, a recent uh, report in Learning by Design uh, has been a real uh, aid to me and in my thinking. Although we have just met him. Um, so, uh, one of the new concentrations, uh, which it always should have been, but it's just uh, newly evolving, is first floors. Mm -hmm. And that how much first floors provide uh, users and the public <coughs> with a sense of the nature of the building as a whole. And, uh, and so um, a real concentration on that uh, to give people a sense of openness from the first moments in the building. Um, cafes, uh, this is not just about uh, uh, lattes and flat whites. Um, this really is a, uh, is a special place in the building in that it doesn't belong to anyone. So people can come into this space and determine uh, their own practice in that space. And that it uh, catalyzes, as you would see right there at the bottom of the screen, um, social interaction and learning interaction. And uh, so very important spaces, uh, particularly for those first floors and as you will 
see the sense of a, a, an atrium here in the, uh, in the Taylor Family Digital Library. Um, you'll see the importance of those kinds of features as well. And a uh, perfect example is this is the new uh, Calgary Public Library. Mm -hmm. And um, those of you who are at uh, Designing Libraries uh, 7 um, last year uh, would have had a visit in this building one month before it opened. Uh, it's a $245 million project. And a, uh, since that opening has just become a, a new center of the of the city of Calgary and, and speaks to what libraries can be and should be. But they have a, a broad sense of mission and this openness is really a part of, of sharing that sense of what's happening and atria are an important feature for realizing that. Um, this is, is back at the University of Calgary. This is the Energy Environment Experiential Learning Building and uh, as you can see, um, these are steps that everyone is sitting on. Uh, but you, you, can, you can go up inside the building, right on up to the upper floors, through this atrium, and around the spaces, <coughs> it's, um, uh, there's both consultation spaces, and, uh, but a lot of lab spaces, and, uh, as well as classroom spaces, and at the same time, this can be converted, and you can see the screen here, into a large auditorium by uh, placing rows of chairs on these steps up through the building. Uh, transparency of what's going on, uh, to be able to see what, what other people are doing in the space is terribly important. This is the, the uh, uh, Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning. Um, the Taylor name is common to the same people, um, and, uh, uh, and it is an important uh, element of permeability and uh, our sense of interaction, and as you can see once again using the idea of the, uh, of the atrium and uh, being able to look uh, in and out of the building. Um, uh, 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 comfortable encounter space. Um, and uh, uh, this is the uh, is at the University of, of Calgary, and this is the uh, Hunter Hub uh, for entre entrepreneurial thinking. And uh, on uh, Touchdown Tuesday, and one of the features that you'll see in this space that you'll see in the next few slides are um, wheels on every chair and every table, so that in fact, uh, one we can recreate the the purpose of the space very quickly, but also the people coming into the space can create their own uh, environment. Uh, how do we uh, build a building that really supports um, a constant change uh, in, in the involving uh, uh, demands on our role on our campuses? Um, uh, what would be above demountable walls was um, was raised flooring, <laughs> and so uh, I was saying, where is that? Um, both the uh, Watt Center for Innovation as well as the Taylor Family Digital Library have raised flooring and demountable walls. Demountable walls are walls that don't are not uh, load bearing, so they really can be moved, and you can create a very different different spaces are over time you can really create a very different building. The raised flooring provides ubiquitous access uh, to electrical and, uh, and network connectivity. Uh, in the Taylor it provides an electrical outlet for every study space. But the other thing as you'll see is this pipe along the bottom here. It's also uh, heating and cooling. Uh, which is a utility of efficiency and the, and the Taylor Library just received a, an award for clean air uh, for the quality of the air and contributes it to the, uh, to the LEED uh, gold sustainability uh, recognition that the Taylor Library has. So um, this is once again uh, back at the Watt Center for Innovation, Living Labs, 
this is part of a uh, creative inquiry program where 4,000 to 5,000 undergraduate students participate in inter interdisciplinary research each year. Once again, you'll see the, the uh, rollers on the, on the, uh, on the chairs. Uh, here they're uh, monitoring uh, brain functions. So this creation of labs is a really important element in today's design. And um, so this is uh, Lab Next, back at the Taylor Family Digital Library. This area specifically came in response to research we did beginning in, in 2015 uh, with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which asked scholars what they needed to support today's multidisciplinary research. And they gave us, they identified a constellation of services um, that in fact were not the traditional services uh, that in fact have been our, <coughs> our strengths in the past. And we actually designed and, and, and implemented Lab Next specifically in response to this research. What do researchers need today? But the space is a place for access to the constellation but in fact, when we built it, we did not know what people would do in it. And so it is constantly being shaped by practice. And uh, this is uh, uh, the woman to the left, um, well, uh, to, uh, is, uh, is uh, Karen Borier, who's a professor of English. And uh, the woman to her right is uh, Ingrid Reisha, uh, who is a metadata librarian. And in the projects that we have, uh, supported through this grant, uh, this is the kind of scene that has become very common, okay? Uh, these are uh, purposely uh, community, there was uh, another comment about community building there, um, but uh, I think uh, you can very, uh, get, a, get a good sense of the, uh, of the sense of bringing people together uh, as they to create the kind of community that they would want to create. So uh, in wrapping it up, and this uh, I think very much connects with the last things Kelly said um, about the role that universities have uh, in society today. Um, we for the last 10 years we've really been focusing on bringing technology into the spaces. And now we really need to think about humanness. We need to look through a different prism and think about our spaces in relation uh, to the people who use those spaces. And um, through, this, um, through this change and this envisioning a permeable environment, uh, we really can rewire our social and cultural aspects uh, of our spaces. And this is the innovation of ways, not things. And this is the conclusion. I just, really important, this lovely pond where the ducks gather all the time <coughs> is actually a um, wastewater purification reservoir and manages this 265,000 square foot building, uses 48% of what normally a building of that size would use because the water is constantly being purified and put back through the building and important for sustainability as well. And acknowledgements, I definitely want to thank uh, uh, Wagner and, and Watch are, are very creative writers and then uh, colleagues at the uh, Learning Spaces Collaboratory. And I'm going to wrap up the presentation part um, with a really um, brief um, discussion of, of assessment of learning spaces. So let's see if we're, yes. Okay. Um, from my point of view, a lot of the current library space assessment, particularly needs assessment studies, um, is conducted through a variety of methods, both quantitative through mostly through surveys and qualitative methods involving focus groups or interviews, but a lot of attention to diaries or photo studies of how students proceed through their day. 
there are very few what I would consider meaningful post-occupancy studies measuring whether the facilities or the buildings or uh, floors uh, met their goals. The studies that we have at this point demonstrate what students like, and I emphasize like. They like light, particularly natural light. They want to have lots of power. They're often bringing several devices they need to recharge, and they need good Wi-Fi signal throughout the building. They need both solo and collaborative spaces. They do that because assignments are different. Sometimes they need quiet study. Sometimes they need to work with their group. It may be at the time of the semester that they need different types of spaces, or it may be their personality and the way they want to work. But it's not an either or situation, it's both. And they need lots of writing surfaces. They love whiteboards or glass boards, especially ones that are movable. They like to write on glass walls of group study rooms if that's permitted. They love to have tables that have writing surfaces um, on them, whiteboard surfaces, anything possible they like to use. Now, one of the reasons I use this slide is to say, please, please, please don't think you have to collect this same data from your user group. We have so many studies of this. Can't you do something more interesting and more meaningful at this point? So one of the most interesting things that I've seen is a study um, that was presented at the Library Assessment Conference a couple of years ago by Amit Doshi from Georgia Tech and Elliot Felix, who's from Bright Spot Strategy. And what they did in terms of studying students was to identify uh, some students they considered lead users. And in this case, they identified uh, this one because he was part of their student advisory group. And what they learned from, um, th from these lead users, they're attempting to discover new modes of visualizing and communicating their work. The lead user was a chemical engineering major, wanted to visualize chemical engineering data. There are visualization spaces on campus, but he couldn't use them because they were limited to majors or to uh, masters or doctoral students. In my view, this is the important information. What do students want to do to enhance their learning? Why would they need new technologies, or do they need new technologies, and what kinds of things do they want? I also think we should be asking the same questions of lead faculty, faculty who want to do innovative things in their teaching and learning, but they don't have the mechanisms to do that. They don't have the available spaces, technologies, or support from professionals like library and information technology profess professionals. So I think this is the kind of need assessment that I would love to see more campuses doing. So in other words, um, do we know on your campus, do students need places like the EDGE, and this is just one room at the Duke University facility where they can work on GIS and data visualization? Do they need the dual monitors? Do they need a place where they can work with each other and uh, do some peer learning as they work? And when we do these new spaces, like the wonderful iZone at University of Rochester, it's not always going to be easy to determine whether the goals are met. The iZone has really a lofty ambition to be, quote, a creative problem-solving problem space, a program and community designed to empower students to explore and imagine ideas for social, cultural, community, and economic impact. How are we going to measure whether those things are achieved? And I'd say it is possible to measure those things. They're doing a lot of programming of that space. So they can document that programming, they can interview participants, they can do surveys, they can document the projects that come out of that space. All of that is feasible and can then be put into a report to your administrators, to your donors, to your community <laughs> to convey the effectiveness of the space. So I really encourage you as you plan assessment of your learning spaces and your library spaces to think about what's important to your institution because you can't assess everything. 
And so choose one of these or one that's not on the list but is important in your institution and how you determine whether some of your spaces and when I say spaces I really think of it as a combination of spaces technology and support the the kinds of services or programmatic activities that we do that uh, that allow students to and faculty to do new things in our spaces and so if you have some synergies with institutional goals, and this one I'm making up for this space, the Odegaard Library, University of Washington, big commuter school. So when they renovated this space, here they have this really kind of lounge-like space at the entrance, and entry spaces are so important. Does this help with a sense of belonging? Does this help create community at this university? Is that important for retention and persistence, working with other offices on campus to help understand and measure that? Does the family study space where students can bring young children and work on their projects help students with young families complete their degrees and stay at the university? It, these kinds of things are important. So it's beyond learning, it's creating environments where learners can, uh, can foster and can, uh, can do the kind of work that they need to do. So while studying has been the clearest link that we've looked at in libraries and measured whether students are studying in libraries, I would love to see us broaden what we think about in learning in libraries, like undergraduate research, doing capstone projects, uh, learning digital literacy, those kinds of things, all of the uh, capabilities that we have. So that's my very brief um, uh, introduction or thoughts on assessment and now I really wanted to make sure we had time for some questions. So thank you.